Hello and uh, welcome everyone. I just want to thank you guys for joining us today for Exit Plan and Primer. Um, this event is being hosted by the NYBB Group and we have an esteemed group of advisors that cover the realm of exit planning that's going to be joining us here today. So I want to thank each and every one of you for attending. Um, this is going to be the third video in, in our series. And the, the goal with this is to provide the business community some insight into how they can exit their business and what options are available. We are living in some very uncertain times and we've been getting a lot of feedback from clients and colleagues and when is the right time to sell my business? You know, how, you know, how should I sell my business? When should I stop repairing some of my business? Who I should sell it to and so on. And so I think the goal with this, if one takeaway you can get from this is that you can understand what options are available to you and you know, how you can go about the process. So um, as we get started here today, um, my name is Kyle Griffith. I am the managing partner of the NYBB Group. Uh, we have been in business for the past 17 years, servicing the tri-state area. We provide merger and acquisition services to companies that are looking to buy and sell companies. Um, so we provide both buy and sell side representation. My panel here um, comes from different backgrounds between legal, accounting, advisory, exit planning services, and they're going to be sharing their in insights on um, their experience as far as exit planning is concerned. So while we get started, um, are you guys are you guys ready to go? Can you hear? Ready to go. There? Okay, yep. perfect. Uh, th thank you. For Thank you very much for being a part of this. I mean, um, the community needs this information and you guys have a lot of wealth of knowledge combined on the topic. So um, uh, I want to just go first, is go around the, go each one of you guys give a little bit about your background and um, so folks know exactly who is, who are presenting here today in this webinar. So Joe, you mind going first? Sure, Kyle, thank you. And thank you for putting this together, much appreciated. So hi everybody, I'm Joe Malizio. I'm the managing partner of Vishnik McGovern Malizio. We are a law firm in Lake Success, a multi-practice law firm. The bulk of our business centers around estate and trust work, be it estate planning, estate administration, or estate and trust litigation work. I do business work, business transactions. I represent closely held businesses for the most part in all phases from startup right through putting the, the business to rest either through the culmination of an exit plan or some other strategy. And I also do estate planning for business owners. Thank you very much, Joe, appreciate it. Austin? Hey, thanks, Kyle. Um, good to be here today. Kyle, thanks for the invite to, to speak with everybody. Uh, my name is Austin Bransgrove. I'm a managing associate at Wealth Advisory Group financial services firm based in New York with our, our two largest offices in Manhattan and out in Woodbury on Long Island. But we also have an office in Princeton and one up in the capital region. Um, our work spans across a lot of different areas. We do uh, insurance, uh, wealth management work for a lot of our clients. We also do business exit planning, which is what brings us together today. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more, I think, about what that looks like and, and what that means for clients. Uh, but working with closely held business owners is the core focus of mine, uh, helping them understand how their company uh, as, as an asset fits within everything that they want to do personally uh, for themselves and their families. Thank you very much, Austin. Uh, Mr. White? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. And Kyle, again, thank you very much for putting this program together and also inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Stephen White. I am the founder as well as the managing partner of Onyx Partners Group. We are a valuation advisory firm located in northern New Jersey. Now, we offer a variety of different platforms, but we provide only one service, and that's just purely valuation work. We partner with owners for, of course, acquisition and sales, establishing buy-sell agreements. Um, if they are gifting, we obviously help them with valuation and gifting and, and restructuring a company if that need be the case. And even from a um, from help assisting with SBAs. Our main priority is really focusing on the client and, and providing that valuation so they know exactly where they currently are to help them get to that point of, of their ultimate goal. 
So we are a group of evaluators and all we do is just focus on providing that type of expert service that our clients all need. So today we're focusing on that exit side of this. So it'll be great, just like you all listening today to hear from these esteemed individuals. And I just hope that I can provide some clear information as far as how valuable evaluation can be in this process. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you very much, Stephen. Jeff, Mr. Appleman. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. And Kyle, thank you again for inviting us and for me to speak. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking and educating everybody today about the some best practices in the M&A space. And uh, but more about me, my firm is uh, is a group of CFOs, all senior levels, and I specialize in manufacturing, distribution, and other business services. Uh, you know, I've been I've been doing this for a long time, and uh, we focus mainly on helping businesses get ready for the sale. We also do some pre-audit work um, to help companies get ready for the audit. And uh, we'll, we'll be talking more about that today, uh, along with a little uh, uh, real-life business example of something I've been working on for the last year. So thank you, Kyle. Thank you very much, Jeff. Appreciate it. So um, most people hear about exit plan, exit plan and exit strategy. You know, what, what really, in fact, is an exit plan? You know, exit plan is a comprehensive roadmap to successfully exit a privately held business. Uh, the purpose is to maximize the value of the business at the time of exit. Um, you hear about a lot of companies that are planning for their sale, and they usually at sometimes don't get their price or their terms. When an exit plan, the goal of it is to exit when a plan is implemented the goal of that plan is for you to, for the business owner to exit on their own terms um and, and that's what we're going to be talking about today now there are a couple of learning objectives we have laid out we're not going to go in grave detail but at least you can get some takeaways that you can implement back in your your own business uh, we're going to be talking about what options are available the importance of an exit plan uh, the timing like when should you stop preparing to exit your business and how you can maximize your business value via third-party sale so just jumping right into it um, i'm going to start off with you austin you know i, I know you have a, a sure. background in exit plan and you are a certified exit planner so it makes sense for you to take the lead on this topic you know um let's just jump right into it what people are here for they want to know what are different ways that a business owner or company can exit their business yeah um it's a great question the the interesting thing about owning uh your own business is that it's a guarantee that one day you're going to leave um and so you can either do it the way that you want you can hold on to it forever and leave in a box um <laughs> there's a lot of choices there the three ways that i see people successfully leave their their businesses are to do an insider transfer to family members or to their key management team um, a lot of times that's that's fulfilling all the data that I have around the how many times that occurs since so it's probably a mixed bag between that and then the next option which is a third party sale those are probably a combination of somewhere between 40 and 45 percent of um, of all exits total so so 45 percent being insider transfers about 40 to 45 percent being third party sales um and then an esop which is a, an employee uh stock option plan and and those can work with the right companies uh, i know that steven on the call today has some experience with those uh and, and i'm not sure if he'll speak to that at all with the the intricacies but for the right company uh an esop is a great way to exit and then of course you can leave unsuccessfully which is just liquidating the business uh or not getting your terms or getting a bad transaction overall um, but the three ways that it works successfully are insider transfer third-party sale or an esop typically St steven um you, you want to talk a little bit about esop and so folks know exactly what is the esop and you know what's involved sure um so just to keep it very basic an esop is as Austin mentioned, it is another platform for a business owner to transition out of their business and pass it on to uh, their key employees or their employee-owned businesses. And there are hundreds and thousands of ESOPs that are out there in the United States are today, and they continue to be growing because there's different tax advantages that they can actually have. A business owner can continue with their legacy of the business. Because if you think about it, right now we're talking about exiting out of a business. The, the ESOP plan which is falls under the ERISA Act is an employee benefit plan. 
it's nothing that the employees have to put in. It's, it's the growth of the overall business that allows the employees to continue to increase their wealth along with their pension plan or their 401ks. But for the owner, you get a chance to stay on for a predetermined time period, maintain that legacy that you've already created instead of just passing it off. And as Austin mentioned, the third party or internal transfer is a great, but the key is that you want to maintain that legacy. And if that's something that's important for business owners, ESOPs is truly an area to at least have an open dialogue and have a conversation of how that may fit because it doesn't fit every business. There's a lot of different things that go into it, but it is truly a platform that I think a number of people should be aware of and, and it's gaining a lot of traction for whatever reason now, uh, but it's truly something for business owners to even take into consideration. Thanks, Steve. I know, yeah, it definitely has been a hot topic lately, so I'm glad able to share some light on it. Um, mm -hmm. Austin, just going back to you, you, you what, can let's talk a bit more about yeah. what's involved in exit plan and you know what's involved in a full comprehensive exit plan. What are the different steps involved? Sure. So th the process that I use, we walk through uh, six or seven steps, depending on the company and the specifics of what an owner needs. Um, we always start with the owner's personal goals. What do they want to have happen? What's important? And sometimes that, those are financial goals. Those can be um, values-based goals too, right? Like uh, being able to maintain legacy or make sure that the company stays within the uh, community that it's in and it doesn't get moved if a third-party seller uh, or third-party buyer comes in and takes over, things like that. Um, and then we need to assess how much money they need from the transaction net of all taxes and, and the costs in order to achieve and maintain their, their lifestyle. And fortunately, retirement planning is a big uh, ser a primary service that we offer in my firm, so we can speak to that. Um, but I, I don't think very many people are going to sell their companies if they are going to have a dramatically lower standard of living after the fact. And so that's something we have to plan for. From there, we need to evaluate a number of aspects of the company. So uh, we have to craft a roadmap and with input and support from all the other advisors, I like to say exit planning is a team sport. Um, and we need to identify and then focus on the most important issues that we can approve, the most important threats that we might need to address for the business. Uh, and so every company looks a little bit different there, but each company and each exit plan has these key threats that could destroy the owner's ability to achieve their goals. And so we have to work to address that while we also build the value of the company because uh, there's almost always a gap between how much an owner would get net and what they actually need. We need to close that gap. Um, and then obviously we'll work to help make sure that the uh, the terms are, are negotiated well. We use experts in those fields for that, right? We don't do legal work. We're not transaction intermediaries. Uh, but we make sure that the right people are on the bus so that the owner has the advice that they need and the counsel they need during the whole process. Um, it takes, just, just so you know, it typically takes three to six months to put the roadmap together, um, depending on the complexity and, and how many moving pieces and how much we might need to change or improve in a company. Um, implementation will span a longer time frame. So it's, it's a few months to make the roadmap, and then the implementation just depends on how quickly the owner wants to leave. Um, if we have years, then we do it in in pieces over years. If we have 12 months, then we're slamming a lot of stuff through as quickly as humanly possible uh, to make sure that it's ready to go. It's funny, Austin. One thing you, you mentioned that stood out for me was the gap. And that, that's something we experience day in, day out in most companies that contact us when they want to sell their business. And they haven't really taken necessary steps proactively to prepare for that eventual when, when they do sell or do transition off from their business. So the, the value that they believe their business is, the majority of times is 10 times more than what it's actually worth. And that's a big challenge. So um, you, know, you need to have yeah. that conversation with your financial planner, right? To find out, figure out what your plan is for retirement. Because if your business is worth 5 million right. and you need 10 million for, for retirement, there's a 5 million, not a gap. So w w right. what are you going to do at that point? Are you going to cut back in your lifestyle? Are you going to cut back in your cost of living and do things differently? Or are you going to ramp things up and improve it, the value of your business so you can actually you know, sell your business at maximum value? So these are some things you definitely need to yeah. consider. So those are good points. Um, and 
really, we don't talk a bit more about the importance of an exit plan, but it, if you want to maximize the price of your business and upon exit and make it, you know, you definitely want to uh, at least sit, sit down with a, your, your planner and figure out what, what your roadmap is in, in, in that case. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and Kyle, if I can add one more thing, I, I think a lot of times it's easy to think that exit planning is just about um, figuring out what the specifics of the transaction looks like for the exit for that transfer. Really, I think exit planning is largely about maximizing value, minimizing threats, and yeah, we're going to do a transaction there in the middle. But right. the transaction is only effective if we've done the other couple of pieces, and those other pieces are really the crux of what exit planning is. Perfect, perfect. And um, I, know, I know many of you guys are going to have questions. So to the left is a, a, a chat function. Uh, we're going to have a short Q&A segment. So if you have any questions, so we're going to go through about 40 minutes of content. And um, if you have any questions, we're going to make sure we get those addressed at the end, um, to the tail end of the webinar. So be sure to enter your, your questions. So I appreciate you, Austin, and your feedback on that. So we're going to move on to, to market timing. And this is a big one. I mean, with COVID, it definitely has complicated things a little bit. You know, um, so when when we are analyzing an opportunity and when we are consulting, we have done over a thousand consultations since we've been in business for the past 17 years. And through that process, we have kind of learned from history and history typically tends to you know, repeat itself. Now, there's three things that usually need to be in alignment. One is what we spoke about earlier is the business prepared for sale, the business itself is the business ready is the owner ready the business ready you know um and that's just one aspect the second aspect you know is the market ready right you know we look at the market right now the economy i mean unfortunately we have a pandemic and you know we pray for those that have been affected by this but you know the the market right now definitely affects the value of a business. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is, you know, are there buyers out there for your business? So those three things actually need to line up, right? Maximizing your, your business value, the market conditions, and the third aspect is there, you know, are there buyers out there, you know, for for your business? And, you know, just like if you were, you know, I, I love to use the analogy, if you have a, you know, if you feel a chest pain or you have some symptoms or whatever the case may be, you, the first thing you want to do is call your doctor and the doctor is going to run some tests, right? So the same thing for us. We want to run some tests. We want to run some diagnostics on your business. And the best person to do that is a valuation expert. So I, I want to turn this over to you, Steve. And um, you know, to, to, when is a good time that, you know, as, keeping the exit planning process in mind, you know, when is a good time? Also keep COVID in mind as well. And this is a loaded question, but, you know, when is a good time for someone to prepare to sell their business or, or, or get a value, you know, when's a good time for someone to value their business, to do a business valuation? That's what I'm asking. And Steve, I believe you are on mute. If you wanna unmute yourself, you'd be good. Yeah, I didn't wanna give any feedback, so I put it on mute when oh. I wasn't talking. So <laughs> it's an ex excellent question. Um, and it makes me think a little bit more into this because in selling a business is like a creature of habit. Things sit, typically tend to happen regardless of whatever's going on in the marketplace. You're right. The business owner has to have the right mindset. Uh, the market has to be available for you. And then there also has to be a buyer there. So if you keep those three things in place, which you were just mentioning, which I thought were great points, and you understand that the business, when you buy a business or you start a business, a business owner, maybe he didn't verbalize it to you, but she already has in mind that she's going to be exiting out of this business at some point. So to answer your question, when is it a good time to have a valuation done? Long before you actually get into that process of thinking of selling. And the reason being is this, I think of valuation, and, and this is my baby, so I, I'm going to be passionate about this, is that I view valuation as like the alpha and the omega. It's the beginning of the process and it's the, also the ending of the process. But in order for you to get from the beginning to the end, you have to know where you're starting. So by putting a valuation together, you should understand from a business owner what that value is, not to yourself, but from an economic standpoint. Regardless of everything else that's going on, that's my job. I will put all the, the, the correct metrics in place to understand and identify what the value of that business is. Because 
identifying different industries and seeing that because my business is in this particular industry and multiplied it by different multiples. I know a lot of people have heard those terminologies tossed around. That doesn't necessarily give you a true value of your business. Your revenue line doesn't always uh, equate to value of your business, who you are, the employees that you actually have, your market that you're in, the products that you actually have, all those things are unlocked potential of value. So having that valuation done early and knowing where you are, and then if you think about it, then you start working in that process to get to that point, that end game, knowing where you want to go. So there is no magic wand of saying exactly when is the perfect time to do this, but having it done sooner rather than later before you get into that process, waking up one morning and saying, I'm going to uh, sell my business because you don't know what your business is worth. So, and, and, and Austin is smiling over there because you do evaluation and you're ready to sell your business and you look at that valuation and you're like, wait a minute. This is, I thought my business was worth more than this. I can't sell this business right now. Well, if you've done your valuation a couple of years earlier and worked up to that point, we'd be having a different conversation. And that ties into your three points, Kyle, of having a market out there and a buyer. So the valuation is a key component. It's the alpha and the omega. You have to have it done in the beginning to know where you want to eventually go. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. It, 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 it makes a lot of sense. I want to get Jeff's point of view on this because he's there, you know, he, as, a, as a CFO for many companies, he's, mm -hmm. you know, he's the first person that the, the owner's going to call upon. Hey, you know, Steve recommend I get a valuation. You know, I need to get my, 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 my books in order, my financials in order and everything. So, um, Steve, um, you know, from your perspective, when, when is a good time for a business owner to prepare their business for sale? I'm sorry, Jeff. Oh, you said Stephen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Again, <laughs> Kyle, thank you very much. You know, it, it's never too early to start preparing to sell your business. But I always, when a business owner asks me, I always say two to three years ahead of time, they should start really preparing and thinking about the things that they need to do, such as uh, obviously need to think about the success team. And we have some great people on the call today. Uh, there, you know, there are about 13 people on the success team, and, and you got to make sure that you have the right people on the bus. Um, I can't tell you how many times is that, you know, when we talk to business owners, business owners will tell us, uh, you know, they have they have a transactional attorney, but yet yet it's it's a guy that doesn't has never done a transaction before, so he he doesn't know how to prepare those kind of documents. He has a CPA, but the CPA has never done a deal. He's done a great job doing his tax returns, et cetera, but he's never put together that kind of information or, or be able to answer those kind of questions that come up, uh, whether it be taxes or even financial statement uh, presentation. So, so two to three years is probably the most um, realistic time frame to get ready for a sale. If, if it's shorter, you're not gonna get, have a good result. It's interesting because um... You know, you had the recession, you had 2009, you also have currently situation with COVID. Are you seeing it where a lot of business owners think, you know what, I've been through too many downturns in the economy. You know, I need to, ex you know, the time is right for me right now. I can't, I can't go through this again. Are you, are you hearing that from some of your clients? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm hearing it from uh, some, some people there. You know, mm -hmm. some people just don't want to reinvest in their business right now. They've had enough. They've... They've seen, uh, you know, the downturn obviously in 2001 in some businesses in 2008, and many, many of them don't want to reinvest in the business. They want to sell now, but you know, uh, there is, according to most experts, there's trillions of dollars in dry powder out there uh, chasing deals, and there aren't that many deals out there, or even good deals out there. Uh, I spoke to a, uh, a gentleman that works with a lot of private equity and family offices and, and he's, his phone rings off the hooks every day. There, there's money chasing deals and there aren't enough good deals out there for a variety of factors. They manage, you know, we didn't even talk about it, but you know, one of the tenets of a good deal is you gotta have a good management team. You gotta plan out. You can't just be you and you, you be, you know, the chief cook and bottle washer. You gotta, you gotta delegate. You've gotta have other people beside you because if the big bus hits you, you don't want the business to go down. You want to have more than you. You want to have a team. You want to show that you've thought that through. So that's another another preparatory step you can go through. But uh, I, I think it's a great time to sell, in my opinion, um, because there is so much dry powder. Assuming you have a good business and assuming you speak to guys like Austin and others here about what you need, 
and as assuming your needs are realistic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's funny you mentioned having the right team around you. So it works as twofold, right? So internally in your company, you need to have some infrastructure within your company and you need also to have infrastructure outside of your company as well, having a, a deal team. So I decided yes. that I, I want to go to market. Who should I talk to first? Am I going to, do I have a, a, a CPA that can assist me in calculating and making sure that I can minimize my tax implication when I, once I go to market? You know, do I have a planner that's going to help me put together a financial plan? I have a right CFO and an attorney to make sure I'm protected and so on. Someone to do the valuation. So is open when you get in the message here, you want to make sure that you have a team of experts giving you the right right advice uh, when you do when that time does come and you want to prepare to exit. Um, let's let's go on to the next objective on the importance. I mean, we have kind of chimed in this a little bit, but um, Joe, I want to kind of get you involved in the conversation. There's a lot that you can cover here um one from the estate planning end of things right because this is a legacy play right you know most That's people right. when they start a business their goal is i don't know now but i know back in the days when people started a business they, they wanted to be a generational they wanted that generational way they wanted to pass on to their kids you know now it's a little bit different you know we're not we don't see 22nd third fourth generation companies and then from the, from the legal aspect of things you know, you're looking to sell your business, what are my legal considerations? So it's a loaded question. I want you to first handle from estate planning portion and lead into, okay, I'm looking to sell my business. Is my books in order and, and, and um, my, my, my corporate kit, everything is in order. So if you could talk about this, those two um, points, I'd be appreciate sure, Kyle. it. A absolutely. So you're, you're absolutely right in that uh, it, it, there are segments of an exit plan. One of the segments is estate planning. The other important segment, it's sort of a triangle from my perspective, is the financial plan. So all three of those segments work together and one is not more important or less important than the other. So if you have a financial plan in place, it should show you what the value of your business is based upon the valuations that the other presenters already spoke about. And if that financial plan should parlay into your exit plan so that you maximize your value and the sale of your business is maximized from a revenue and proceeds perspective. And it's really a family plan that we're talking about. So not only does that exit plan and estate plan and financial plan cover you and your significant other perhaps but it also covers your other family members it covers your philanthropic efforts things along those lines so everything has to be taken into account to again maximize the value for you maximize the value for your heirs and make sure that you're able to function both during your life and that your family is able to function after your death we also want to look at various other estate inclusive aspects from a tax perspective, for instance. So if you continue to own your business at death and you pass that business on in a will or trust as a, a bequest, then you would have a stepped up basis in that asset to the fair market value as of the date of your death. So does that make sense in any fashion to wait and have your heirs receive that stepped up basis rather than engaging in an outside sale which could maximize your stream of revenues and asset base for your financial plan and could also result in you increasing those assets through investments and things of that nature versus leaving that business in your estate plan one aspect that people also look at quite often in an exit plan and an estate plan is commercial real estate. Some business owners who own real estate as a part of their business decide that they're going to maintain the commercial real estate as a source of revenue and income. And that real estate can in fact pass on to their heirs as a bequest and an asset that continues. So we have a number of things to look at that affect that triangle from the financial plan, the estate plan, and the exit plan, and they all work together. Uh -huh. And, you know, one, this has happened twice to me this year where I've had um, clients that had prospective businesses 
that they wanted to exit and their spouse actually had passed away and they had no didn't have any plans in in place it just made things a little bit difficult you know so i mean i i think having i mean someone passing away is, is to the extreme but it doesn't even have to be that someone can become ill and incapacitated you may have a multi-partner firm and you know you have one partner that's no longer um, not available, you know, not is, is ill, whatever the case may be. And so you want to make sure that you have all different plans in place. Can, can you talk more, more about from, uh, from the corporate end of things, from the, uh, w the legal considerations that you need to consider when you're planning an, an, an exit? Sure. And this is where the time frame is very important also. That two or three year period can allow you from a legal perspective to put things together so that when it comes down to entering into the transaction for the sale and transfer, you're not in a position where you're scrambling to obtain information. As a example, I have somebody now that's engaged in selling their business with a piece of commercial real estate attached to it. And the business is in an estate of somebody that uh, started the business in the 1970s. But from the start of the business through today, there's never been a succession of ownership. There have never been stock certificates issued. It's a C corporation. So there's no evidence of who actually owns this business. So now we're going back with the buyer's council and with the title company on the sale of the commercial real estate to try and show who the actual shareholders and the succession of shareholders is for this business. Uh -huh. So one of the most important things in a sale transaction in the document that a seller will sign and give to their buyer for security purpose, that sale transaction will contain representations and warranties. And those are probably the lengthiest portion of a purchase and sale document. So the seller and the buyer each represent and warrant to each other. But from the seller's perspective, those warranties and representations will cover things such as ownership of the business. It will cover the right to sell the business, that there are no other documents or anything along those lines which would prevent the sale. Now, that could be a lease. If the business intends to transfer or assign the lease to the buyer, that lease has to be reviewed to see if the landlord's consent is required. There are many other things like that. And in this current pandemic climate, just about every business has received a PPP loan. Well, I don't think anybody knows to what extent the portion of those loans that are going to be repayable, whether or not those loans can be assigned or assumed by a potential purchaser. And we have a potential of two years that those loans are going to be repaid. So something like that could definitely come into play. And we need to look at that to make sure that things are set up properly so that when you are giving those representations in the actual sale agreement, you're not going to get stuck with your buyer coming back and saying, wait a minute, you misrepresented A, B or C and your value isn't as significant as you thought it was or the buyer might be looking to you for indemnification under the agreement, meaning you'll have to give back a portion of your purchase price at some point because you didn't represent your business properly. Yeah, you definitely don't want, want, don't want that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Austin, um, oh, can you chime in yes. a little bit? Um, I know you kind of start off here and you know, the options available, but can what, what, from an, what are some important things that business owners need to, need to, um, need to think about when they're putting the plan together. Yeah. Um, but maybe it'll be helpful. I'll just give some examples of, of ways it could go wrong, I guess, without yeah. a plan. Right, um, right. I think, I think worst case scenario is you don't sell the business. Um, and that is totally possible. Roughly four out of five companies don't get sold the first time they try. Um, so it's, it's not only possible, it's highly likely that it won't work if you don't have a plan. I think more frequently, if there's some sort of a plan, if you have a good uh, broker or investment banker on your team to do the third party sale, uh, or if you're doing a family transaction where your kids are going to buy it no matter what because they're your kids, um, 
it may not be an ideal sale, but you could get it done. The terms just won't be very good, or you'll lose control of the company before you'll have all of the money that you need. That's a big thing that I see. Um, I think sometimes threats can pop up, and and uh, Jeff spoke to this a little bit about the importance of having your management team there. Um, you know, so I'll give a quick example. There was a company a few years ago that um, had refused to put any retention plans in place for their top executives. It was going to be a third party sale. And so the buyers just before the deal closed, right, came and interviewed some of the, the top leadership that was going to stay with the business and run it. And so they're talking to the VP of sales and they tell them, hey, you're really important. We're really glad that you're in this company. We wouldn't be buying it without you. Okay. And um, the, the guy's no, no chump. So he says, can you excuse me one minute? He walks around to his boss's office, the owner's office, and says, hey, so you're selling the company. Congratulations. Uh, they just told me how they wouldn't even be buying it if I wasn't here. So I need a million-dollar bonus this day. And no, no joke. This is a true story. And so um, the owner – cut the million dollar check because he was going to be out well into eight figures if he didn't um, get the business sold. And I'll tell you, the retention plans that we suggested were a lot cheaper than what that ended up costing him. Um, but just an example, things happen. You can't predict all of this stuff. Um, and that's why it's important that you need to rely on the advisors like us in your world uh, to say, hey, this can happen. This will really mess up your plans. Let's address it. Um, looks like my video cut out, but it, I, you can still hear me, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, yeah. And lastly, I think if you don't take the time to engage in planning, I'll just say sometimes you won't even know what was possible, right? Like you won't have explored the other routes that maybe would give you a better offer that was better aligned with your goals because you just didn't take the time to do planning. You saw the one route out that some of your, you, you've heard of or you read on the internet can, can happen. And then you didn't pay attention to anything else that was possible. Um, again, you might get it done. You might mm -hmm. leave, but maybe you're leaving a lot on the table. Got it. Now, also, I want to stage you for a second, and I just want to still take us to um, our fraud objective here. What are some some things that business owners can do right now, you know, to maximize yeah. their business value? Some quick quick, quick pointers for folks. Yeah, that, uh, there's a lot of things. I'll I'll give you three or four, um, just just in quick order here. And I think I will say these work regardless of whether you want to do a third party sale, whether you want want to own the company forever or whether you want to sell it to your management team or to your kids or something. Um, these are just value drivers in a business. And so they're important regardless of what your plans are. The first is have a stable and increasing cash flow. Be able to document it. Like have clean books that show where money comes from and how you make it. Um, I know that doesn't sound like it's overly complicated, but plenty of companies can't show that. Um, the second is have a stable, motivated management team. The company needs to be able to live if you are on vacation for three months. The company needs to be able to run if you're gone for six months. If it can't, you're going to have a hard time selling it for the top price. Um, you need to have a solid, diversified customer base. It's great if you make a lot of money, but if 90% of your revenue is from one customer, that's a big red flag to a buyer. Because if that relationship sours or if um, you landed that deal and when you leave, that deal leaves too, the company is not going to be worth nearly what you might be asking for it. Um, and then lastly, I think you need to have an effective, uh, realistic growth strategy, right? Don't come in with some numbers and year-over-year -year projections that are not attainable. You need to understand what are you going to do to continue to have growth because growing cash flow is what someone's buying the company for. They're not buying it for last year's cash flow. They're buying it because they think they can continue to make more money in the future than you did in the past. Mm -hmm. 
Thank, thank you, Austin. Steve, anything to, from a valuation perspective, yeah. any, anything else you, you can add? I know Austin, yeah. you shared some good points and those are a lot of things our buyers, when they contact us, they ask for recurring revenue, who is the key management, customer concentration. Those are three things we hear on and on, um, you know, on and on again. Um, Steve, from a valuation perspective, yeah. what are some things that you can add if someone's looking to sell, let's say in the next one to three years or so? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a good one. Thank you for putting that time frame on there, one to three yeah. years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> business owners and, and, and buyers look at things from different lenses. Buyers are looking for what they can get out of that business. Not necessarily where it is today, but what they can get out of it. And business owners are looking to sell what they've already put into the business. So from a real life situation of what we worked on before, where we had a business owner that wanted to sell the business and Austin hit on something that was extremely important is, and it can be tricky, right? From a business owner, you're trying to sell that business, but the people that help drive that business are your key management team and your employees. We would advise the owner if their time frame is very short in that one to three year period, um, get your management team on board because that's going to be a central important piece of this. Your 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 distribution, your your client list, and these are things that you're not going to find on the balance sheet or in your financials when you're when you're selling your business. These are the intangible assets. Those intangible assets have a significant amount of value in that business. If you have your employees and your and your management team on board and they understand what that transition is supposed to look like, it can be a risk play, but just like anything else, risk reward, right? That's something that I would take into consideration to, to sit down with your key people, your key management team and explain to them exactly what's going on. Be very transparent and explaining that you would like to transition this business, but here are the things that we need to do in order to get this business to that point. The second point is cash flow. Cash is king. Um, you need to understand what your growth rates are in your business and help you identify what your cash flow is. And then your second step is to, your third step in this process is really to identify a few, uh, forecasting. To to Austin's point, and he's come, you and I should be working together, Austin, on this, is that you want to make certain that your forecast is in line. You don't want to be too aggressive because that's going to scare away real good uh, potential buyers. You want to be realistic, something that's sustainable when you're putting together your forecast. And as an evaluator, we'll look at people and tell them, no, this is not realistic. You've never done that before. Why, are you, why would I assume that you're going to have that type of growth and your cash flow from that standpoint? Of it? And then the last one, obviously, your free cash flow. Mm -hmm. um, you want to make sure that free cash flow and you want to reduce the amount of expenses that you actually have. And again, as I go back to what I shared with you before, is that your revenue line doesn't always translate to, to value. So your free cash flow, that's the number that you should be really focusing on if you're trying to transition that business in that one to three year period. Um, but having the exit planning team, your strategy team together is going to be critical because what we will do is give you that valuation report. It's not just the value in that report. It's the KPIs that are within that report, those key performance indicators. That's what's going to help you continue to grow your business and make it more attractive. That's what's going to help it become more appealing to a buyer um, because you put everything in it. They're going to see what they're going to be able to get out of it. Thanks, Steve. And um, mm -hmm. we, we're going to jump into our Q&A segment um, right now, but I, I want to kind of lead into the Q&A with a question for, for Jeff. I know we got some questions from from the audit, from the attendees, and one of them wanted some real life perspectives. So, you know, it wants some real life stories as far as yeah. deals that, that we have worked on and how it relates to the current situation. So, um, mm -hmm. I know as a CFO, you're in the trenches and you've seen a lot working with your clients. Um, you're trying to reduce costs. You know, um, Steve talked about cash is king and you know forecasting and so on. That kind of falls in your neck of the woods. You, you mind sharing a little bit about, yeah. e even if it's a personal story or something sure. related to our particular clients uh, with yeah. the attendees? Yeah, thanks, Kyle. I, I, I would be happy to. I just want to, before I get into the story, I just want to share one thing. One of the things we didn't talk about today, and there's so many things in exit planning and exit uh, strategy, is we didn't talk about um, one of the first things, in addition to all the things that you guys are going to do, is uh, you want to calculate a bidder. What does your bidder mean? What are the addbacks? Is it clear and identifiable? I can't tell you how many times I've looked at deals with clients and they have no clue on what their addbacks are. Uh, they, they, they either don't make money or they can't define what they're taking out of the business because they're a closely held business 
and it's an extension of their personal life. And uh, that I've often seen deals fall apart on that because they always say, don't worry about it. And I always say, well, you should worry about it because the buyer, if it's too complicated, the buyer is going to walk. So uh, that that's one of the first things that I always sit down. And before we even go through that and we determine uh, with the financial planner what you need, let's figure out what the business really is making before we move forward. So let, let me take you to a real life example. About a year ago, um, we got contacted by a uh, two owners that are in the event management business. Uh, they provide medical education to certain medical professionals. They've been in the business 30 plus years. Uh, they keep their books on the cash basis of accounting. And they wanted to sell their business really rapidly. So obviously there were a couple of things that had to happen. Uh, you know, they had to do a quality of earnings. They had to get convert their books from cash to accrual. Uh, their books were sloppy and really weren't presentable to a particular buyer or even to a quality of earnings firm or even to the investment banker. So we went through the process of gathering that information together to present it in a coherent fashion. It took us a while to get to, to get it done because they had also didn't have any professional bookkeeping or accounting. It was done by the wife of one of the owners. And she did the best she can, but uh, she was, uh, you know, she didn't, she only knew what she knew based on what was self-taught. Fast forwarded to uh, recently with COVID, we've completed three years of reviewed financial statements. They completed the quality of earnings report. They hired an investment banking firm, spent a lot of money with all these folks. And unfortunately, they were a little late in the game. And as a result, the, the deal was pulled uh, within the last month or two. Uh, they had a bunch of buyers. They got some really nice offers over the period of time. Um, but it just took, the process took too long. And again, the, the, uh, the moral of the story was they didn't do enough planning ahead of time. They waited too long to react to plan because they really wanted to sell this business in February. And, and they didn't really have an appreciation for all the things that had to happen in order for them to sell. You know, it's an interesting story. I mean, um, I mean, COVID has just thrown a monkey wrench in a lot of people's businesses, right? So um, it's something that's really, really hard to predict. Um, so let me just add one other thing, Kyle, if I may. If I may. The inter interesting thing out of all this, Dave, uh, they have developed a robust digital platform and they're getting more people than they would in person. Will that translate to more value creation for this business when they want to go back to market? Uh, the end of this year, or early next year, that's to be determined. But uh, they they really do a great job with uh, putting on these events. Uh, they just didn't do a great job in in worrying about their financial house and how that right. presents itself. It's funny you mentioned I had a conversation yesterday with an event management company, and um, they like most event management companies, they they, they need events <laughs> to, to grow their business, <laughs> and they're going completely virtual. I mean, they're doing all kinds of events and they're bringing the acts virtual. You know, they're using, you know, Zoom yeah, that yeah. been pretty, pretty popular. Um, and then the acts that have usually been live at the event, they would have to actually actually be so they would if it's they're doing a kid's party, they have a the owner of a farm has like about 30 or so animals. They're showing the, the kids the farm feeding, um, you know feed in time, whatever. If there's a clown show, they bring the clown up on the camera. Um, they're doing corporate events, team building. So, you know, it's, it's funny when, when one door shuts, another opens, right? So the opportunity to sort of pivot um, is not the case for every, in every no. business. You know, so so where, where do you leave off with that particular company? Where, what's their... Well, the, the good news is they realize the importance of planning now and what they're doing moving forward mm -hmm. is they're starting to put together metrics on a quarterly basis, which they never did. The only metrics we have were on an annual basis. So they're part of starting to put that together. And the good news is that we're going to have some information that we could share with would-be buyers on how we perform on a quarterly basis. So that's that, that's the good news that's come out of that. And, uh, you know, like, like every other business out there, there's tons of dry powder, as I said before. So I, I think there'll be tons of business, tons of buyers for this particular business, whether it be a strategic or a, a private equity firm, that will want this business because their margins just are incredible. Right. Uh, we did get a question. We could use your example as a case study, but a question from someone that stated that their business has been shut down, right, for a couple of months. 
due to COVID and how does that impact their valuation, right? Their business is now um, not not operational. It has affected their revenue. Now, um, I can tell from my experience and the bankers that I have spoken with, many of the SBA, um, many of the bankers are allowing some add back. So what has happened with COVID is a one-time effect. So um, they are accounting, they are adding back a portion of the revenue that you would have lost due to COVID. Now, the question is, when things get back to normal, whatever normal is, you know, are you able to ramp ramp back up? No one has a crystal ball. We don't know. Are you going to get back to prior um, COVID numbers? Nobody really knows that. So, th- from a buyer perspective, from a, from a buyer reviewing your business, I, I think in your presentation you have to not really sell the buyer, but paint a picture. Of, hey, we have done X amount of revenues prior to COVID. This happened, and this is what we're doing now to sustain and grow past COVID. So you have to kind of lay out a roadmap of how you're going to grow your business post COVID. It's not an easy, um, it's no easy answer to that. Um, any, any of you guys have anything to add? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'll jump in there for just for a quick moment. I think also you have to look at the industry, right? Everyone doesn't fall into that same bucket. Even though we're going through a traumatic situation right now, not all industries are bad. Uh, some industries are doing extremely well. Um, grocery stores are doing well. Um, reinventing yourself, like you said, about the conference setting. It, I would go back and take a look at what the business was doing before, how they were operating. This is where your this team would go in and sit down with that management team and really do a, a due diligence of understanding what have you already put in place? Understanding what type of future did you have plan for this particular business. If it's to do everything that you've been doing before the last five years, yeah, that's a different conversation. But if you were trying to be innovative, your technology was already starting to be in place, but you just, this happened too soon. That's a different conversation that you're having as far as potential buyers out there, because you're already starting to put that infrastructure together. I just think it's, 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 it depends on, on your business. It depends on your owner and your management team for you to go in there and, and really do a due diligence instead of just saying that just because COVID happened, did your business go down? Would it have been on the back nine before COVID? There's only one way to find that out. And that's where you do your forensic understudy of that overall company. Not to sound gloom and doom on that side, but it is something that we have to do and then examine the company from that perspective. So it depends. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. Another question is, someone's asking, one of the things asking if there's any do-it-yourself options. Someone's looking to get a valuation of their company. Um, any, I guess, I guess Zillow type or on-demand type of value reports. And uh, <laughs> you, you guys know my opinion of that, you know. So here's the yeah. thing. And I, I can say this, and Steve, you can kick me in the butt. You could, you know, you can. I'll you step can, away. I'll turn my camera off and close my ears. Right. So <laughs> the valuation is just one's person opinion that's all that's all it is okay um now you want an opinion that has some credibility behind it right so you you want to work with a company that can actually value a company and give you a credible valuation however there are rules of thumb out there right that you can utilize um but it just <laughs> that one person's opinion the value of a business is what the price someone's willing to pay for your business you know, so um, Steve, you can you, you can jump in wherever you want, but you know we have done. I have deals where <laughs> it's been usually it's been pretty close. You know, when we when we do our assessments to the value, and we you always like to get at someone like Steve or someone else to give a third party valuation of the company because, like I said, it's just one personal opinion. So my opinion may not be Steve's opinion, may not be Austin's opinion, but you want to collect the data, and as a business owner, you know you want to have all information and make your right decision because it's, it's, it's your business, right? Yeah. But you want to make sure you get the right professional yeah. advice. But um, yeah, Kyle, go can, ahead. Can oh. I hop in for one second on this? <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. So there's, let me say, there is some software that we use at my firm that tells us basically what zip code we're in as far as valuation, right? It's like, where, what are we talking about? Are we talking about a company that's worth like fifteen million dollars? Are we call, talking about a company that may be worth like thirty million dollars? Okay, um, those snapshots, and we use this. It's online software. You have to pay to use it, so I don't know that it's particularly helpful to be DIY. Um, but 
yeah, if, if you, you want a snapshot, give me a call, depending on how complicated it is, we'll help you look at that. Um, it's not usable. Like we have all of the disclosures on there. This is not anything that you should ever use to back up a transaction price. You shouldn't be using this for estate planning valuation. You shouldn't be using it for uh, tax communications with the IRS. It's not that. Like for any of these things, you need somebody like Stephen to come in and take a look and tell you what it is and what it's worth. Um, we use a software, like I said, to, to determine the zip code that we're in for a client to say, okay, do we need to go with more complicated strategies and conversations? Or are we okay with slightly less complexity with everything that's going on? That's sort of what we, we use it to assess and figure out how quickly do we need to get a professional valuation, things like that. It, it's more of a testing the waters kind of a thing. It's yeah, never going to be used for a transaction. There's software out there that you can use. There's many of them. You can Google them. Um, so just recently, this just happened just recently. So we've been representing a particular company and um, our valuation, the offers we received for this valuation, now it says probably about five to 10% off, um, meaning that the offer is 5%, 10% lower than our valuation um, for, for that particular mm -hmm. company. Um, the client spoke with their financial plan and the financial planner offered them a valuation through a particular service. I'm not gonna mention the name, and the valuation came in two times higher than our valuation. So their valuation is here, ours is here, and the market is here. So that can just give you a perspective on what, you know, there are different types of valuation. Is this, is who's putting information in, who's reviewing it, and what's, what's the data? It's, it's, really, it's really tough. And I would say, you know, you want to get you know, professional advice. Um, uh, another question came in. Are they yeah, buy it? Right? Let me go on. Let me go on. Let me just let me just address the gentleman's question or, or the or young lady's question, or whomever. Um, I apologize. Do it yourself. You can do an assessment for yourself of evaluation. Um, you don't necessarily have to do a software to to get those. You can, I, if that's what you would like to do. But I would caution you: just don't run with that number because your business is different than every other business that's in that industry. That that's where all those numbers are collaborated from. Um, if you like, I think that they're going to give an email, our emails or contact information out. If you can reach me or someone else in our office, we'll be happy to have a consultation just to show you a couple of things that you need to do. Um, and then you can take that and then you can create a do-it-yourself valuation there. I'd feel more comfortable from my own profession to run, to do that as opposed to you going to these different softwares out there. Uh, to Kyle's point, you need to deal with somebody who understands the industry and that marketplace. So evaluations are here, here, and then here where the market is. That means that person doesn't understand that industry and doesn't understand that market. So reach out to us or anybody on this on this panel. I'm pretty sure that we'll all be very willing to help you and just walk you through how to do it yourself just for an initial idea of the valuation of your business. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Stephen. And, and one right. final question before we kind of get back to, to you know, close things off. And I want to take it back to you, Jeff. Uh, one of the questions came in, are there buyers right now in the market? I can tell you from, from what we are seeing, there are lots of buyers. There is money out there. It's just that buyers are more cautious now. So you, you, you think, and then everything is on sale. So you, know, you have to kind of take that in perspective. What's going to separate your company from others? What's your unique selling proposition? What's going to make your dif differentiate your business from others? Um, so using your example, Jeff, with your event um, management company, event planning company, I think it was, um, were there buyers? You said it were buyers, right? Are the buyers still, what's the status with those buyers? The buyers all uh, faded away because of the uncertainty of COVID. There obviously, there's too much uncertainty with the event management business. We don't know when a vaccine will be available in this case, and you can't congregate large numbers of people at an event. You just can't. So uh, everything is on hold right now, and uh, I, many of them will probably come back um, early next year. And by then, we're going to have better data, better information, and uh, and then I think some many of the buyers will feel a lot more comfortable. But it's a great business, great business. Even many of the buyers have told my client that uh, they love the business. Um, they just wish that would have gone to market a little sooner because they were getting, as, as, as you've heard many times, they got a lot of unsolicited offers 
in the beginning and they were negotiating directly with them. They got smart and they finally contacted a professional uh, guy like yourself to help them through the process. Uh, but it just they, they just were too slow to get their act together. Got it. And uh, Joe, do you have any, um, I'll give you the last um, word on this. You know, anything you'd like to share from a real life perspective or in, in general on exit planning and the topic we discussed today? Yeah, so one of the things that we haven't um, really focused on are taxes. Um, we've been talking about valuations and protecting uh, the seller, obviously protecting the buyer through documenting uh, the transaction properly. But I'm often uh, approached by clients who say, I want to sell my business and we, they have a valuation done and they're thinking, okay, this is not bad until somebody finally says to them, now we need to look at the tax aspects of this transaction and see if it's structured properly or favorably for you. And they're often blown away when they see uh, what the tax situation is going to net them out. So you wanna be really diligent in working with a tax professional, be it an attorney or an accountant, who can give you a very fair estimate of what your tax situation is going to be. That's a good point. We actually had a scenario that happened to us last year, actually. We had a deal, I'm not going to go into much detail because of time constraints, but it's still after the, the hour, top of the hour now, but we had a deal where the owner failed to make those necessary preparations and um, he had a huge tax hit and he decided to take the business off the market um, because of that. So you, you make a, a, you know, a, very, a very good point there. Um, uh, I mean, this this comes to um, the end of our of our webinar. I, you know, I appreciate each one of you giving your feedback. Austin, Joe, Jeff, Stephen, information is very powerful. Um, I, I hope hopefully we provide some, provide some information to you, everyone that's beneficial. You can take back um, to your business. Um, we're going to send out a, an email with everyone's contact information if we can get a, uh, get in contact with any, any one of the speakers that are on the panel here today. Um, we you also receive a link to our past two webinars. Uh, this one has been recorded, so you get access to this recording once it's uh, fully processed. The next webinar um, is going to be on June 10th. Um, my partner in crime, um, Anthony Sotrolo. Uh, he's a founder of our company. Um, he's going to be hosting um, the webinar. He's going to be talking about post-pandemic sale of the family-owned businesses. So uh, what to expect in these um, in today's historic time. So uh, I appreciate you, one of you, and um, please be safe. And I guess you're going to be doing these virtual meetings a lot moving forward because of COVID, but um, at least we can still connect and share some information this way. Thank you, each and every one of you guys, and hope to, you know, be safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.